Welcome to a Programming Languages Virtual Meetup post recording. My name is Connor Hookstra, and in this video, we're going to be covering chapter three of seven languages in seven weeks and the second language of seven languages, IO. So, some thoughts on the language IO off the top of this video. My, my first thought is that the website is very beautiful, but the binary downloads from this website are broken. So, that means that you have to do one of two things. Um, I built from source. They have a link to the GitHub where you can just get clone and then build from source. However, you get a version from 2017, which I'll comment on in a second. I also heard, and I'm on Linux, so that's where I was building from source. I heard that some folks that were building on Mac were able to get it from a brew install. However, the versions that they got were either from 2011, 13, or 15. Um, so a little bit tricky tracking down how to get an actual binary that is able to run this language. And that leads to the unfortunate situation that they have a bunch of libraries that are listed in the docs that are have pretty rich APIs. However, depending on the version that you get, you don't have access to all of these libraries and the APIs. Uh, so for instance, when I was using list, some of the functions that the doc said that uh, the, the methods that list had, the list object, didn't actually... Um, in the version that I was using exist. So a little bit unfortunate. So maybe we should have, have chosen self, which is a very similar language, but a little bit more popular, I think. But anyways, that's just kind of a joke. And my last and final comment is that the at and double at um, notation, which are the sort of concurrency primitives uh, for calling functions or methods asynchronously, weren't really covered uh, very deeply in this book, which was, a, or in this chapter, which was a bit disappointing. But we also have Erlang to look forward to, so hopefully we'll get a little bit more in-depth coverage of sort of concurrency when we get to that chapter. Hopping into the table of contents, you can see here we have three different days, uh, similar to the previous chapter on Ruby, with a short introduction and a wrapping up section as well. So hopping into the introduction section, the text reads, Steve DeCourt, hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly, invented the I.O. language in 2002. It's always written with an uppercase I followed by a lowercase O. I.O. is a prototype language like Lua or JavaScript, meaning that every object is a clone of another object. Written as an exercise to help Steve understand how interpreters work, I.O. started as a hobbyist language and remains pretty small today. And I would even add that since this book has been written, it's kind of, um, I wouldn't necessarily say died. I'm sure there's a few places it's still being used, but it's definitely not actively developed anymore. And this sort of ties into the interview that Bruce Tate does with Steve in the day one part of chapter three, where Bruce Tate asks, why did you write IO? And Steve answers, in 2002, my friend Drew Nelson wrote a language called Cell, inspired by self, and was asking for feedback on its implementation. I didn't feel I understood how programming languages work well enough to have anything useful to say, so I started writing a small language to understand them better. It grew into IO. So self uh, famously is a derivative of small talk, and self went on to inspire Cell, which sort of inspired IO. So the lineage of IO you might um, show as the following self, small talks inspiring self, and then self inspiring IO. And uh, very curiously, uh, self is actually on the Wikipedia page of self shown to be inf in influenced by two different languages small talk and one of my favorite languages, APL. And I went and tracked down the self paper that documents the history of self in one of the Hopple conferences, link in the description down below if you're interested to read that, and found the following excerpt, which I'll read. APL was an interactive time-shared system that let its users write programs very quickly. Although not object-oriented, it exerted a strong influence on both, sm on both Smalltalk and Self. Ingalls has reported its influence on Smalltalk, and APL profoundly affected Unger's experience of computing. Dan Ingalls, which is what Ingalls refers to, was a highly influential, influential person that worked on Smalltalk, and Dave Unger, which is what Unger refers to, is the creator of Self, who also did, I believe, his dissertation, his PhD dissertation on Smalltalk. In 1969, Unger had entered the Albert Einstein Senior High School in Kensington, Maryland, one of only three in the country uh, to have an experimental IBM 1130 time-sharing system. Every Friday afternoon, students were allowed to program it in APL, and this was Unger's first programming experience. Though Unger didn't know it at the time, APL differed from most of its contemporaries. It was dynamically typed in that any variable could hold a scalar vector or matrix of numbers or characters. APL's built-in and user-defined functions were polymorphic over this range of types, otherwise known as rank polymorphism. It even had operators, higher-order functions that were parameterized by functions. The APL user experienced a live workspace of data and program and could try things out and get immediate feedback. Ungar solely missed this combination of dynamic typing, polymorphism, and interpretive feel when he went on to learn such mainstream languages as Fortran and PL1. Pretty funny that they're calling uh, mainstream languages Fortran and PL1. 
as I guess you might say that Fortran still is because there is it is actively used in scientific communities, but PL1 is definitely not. So anyways, that tangent's over. I will leave, like I said, a link in the description down below if you want to check that paper out. Back to the uh, lineage or history of how we got to IO. So um, technically we should draw an arrow pointing from APL to Smalltalk because um, APL also inspired Smalltalk in many ways. And uh, Smalltalk uh, sort of directly influenced IO as well. So technically we should add an arrow here as well. So now that we have this diagram, we can technically combine it with our diagram from the Ruby video, which looks as follows. And if we uh, switch the Smalltalk and Lisp logos and then juxtapose these two diagrams next to each other, we can see that they can overlap with the Smalltalk and we can combine them as such. And at this point, we're going to go on another tangent because I had the thought that I was getting a little bit irritated of trying to build these up by hand and that I could probably automatically generate these using a Python script. So I, at first, I tried to do this using a library called Networks X, Network X because that's what uh, Google told me to do. That was a failure. I then moved on to GraphViz, which was much more successful. So now I can automatically generate these, and you'll see this in future videos, potentially. Uh, and the day that I did this, I got a little bit carried away and added a ton of other languages. So if you want, you can go and check this out. I have an even more sort of extended graph that adds... Um, languages that I'm specifically interested in, like SASL, KRC, FP, and FL. Um, but you can check this out at my GitHub under the PL Graph uh, repository. Link in the, will be in the description down below. Back to this lineage from Ruby and IO. And uh, the last final thought that I had when building this up was that Lisp, Smalltalk, APL, and Erlang are all actually languages that overlap with a blog that I wrote once called Galaxy Brain Programming Languages, which is heavily inspired by Ben Dean, one of his tweets and one of his blogs called Six Languages Worth Knowing. I'll put links to all of those in the description down below as well. And I thought that maybe at, w at some point in the future, I will combine this blog uh, the, the, and then the title of two of sort of, you know, really good book series, The 97 Things Every Programmer Should Know. There's a bunch of different books like that. And then the Seven Languages books uh, to get the following book, a uh, Seven Languages every programmer should know. Maybe I'll write it, maybe I won't. Um, if you'd be interested in something like this, maybe leave a comment in the description down below. Back to IO. So we will now hop into day one. We are not going to go into a lot of detail. Like I said, this is just supposed to be a supplementary video for having worked through the chapter already. But let's take a look at some IO code. So we have a REPL here. You can do little calculator calculations like 1 plus 2 to get back 3. If you uh, type a string, hi-ho, IO, uh, you get back the string. You can also um, call a method on this string, which is print, and then it's going to basically uh, print out two different things. It'll it'll print out the hi ho I O, and then also returns to the last value, which is also hi ho I O. And here at the very bottom, we can see um, how you basically create objects. You use the clone keyword and uh, the walrus operator, which is the colon equals. And you go, um, you choose your object that you want to clone from. Here we're just cloning the root object, uh, which is called object, and then we get our vehicle. And uh, you can see that there's one sort of uh, slot called type that is being assigned um, the name of this type, which is vehicle. And to say a little bit more about types, the text says, types in IO are just conveniences. Idiomatically, an object that begins with an uppercase name is a type, so IO sets the type slot. Any clones of that type, starting with lowercase letters, will simply invoke their parent's type slot. Types are just tools that help IO programmers better organize code. So um, good to know. Moving on to some more IO code, here we are now setting the description slot to initially say something to take, uh, to take your place. Something to take you places. I don't know. There's probably a uh, typo there. And note that we're using the walrus operator to uh, sort of initialize this description slot. And then after we do this, we can reset it using just an equal sign to something to take you far away. And if you try and use an equal sign to assign to a slot that doesn't exist, AKA the non-existing slot, you're gonna get an error. Uh, moving on to some more IO code. So here now when we call a vehicle description, we're basically calling the slot description on vehicle. It'll give you back what you last set it to, which in this case is something to take you far away. And they also have a uh, message very similar to the methods uh, method in Ruby, where it'll give you a list of all the messages uh, and slots um, basically on your object. So vehicle has both the description because we've set it and type because we uh, declared it with a capital V. And if we go vehicle type, it gets back vehicle and object type gets back object. And on the next two slides are comparisons kind of of the object model. So this is the 
or object-oriented design that we saw, um, very similar to what we saw in Ruby. This is not what IO does. IO does the following, um, where basically instead of each object having a sort of superclass, uh, every you, you don't have classes in IO. You just have objects. So every object has a prototype, which is basically the object it was cloned from. Um, so here you see we have object at the root, vehicle was cloned from object, car was cloned from vehicle, and then Ferrari with a lowercase f was cloned from car. And so you can see each of these has a prototype, which is basically just the object that it was cloned from. So no classes in IO, just objects, whereas in Ruby and other languages like Smalltalk, you have both classes and objects. Moving on to what the text says about prototypes. In Ruby and Java, classes are templates used to create objects. Bruce equals person.new creates a new person object from the person class. They are different entities entirely, a class and an object. Not so in IO. Bruce uh, colon equals person clone creates a clone called Bruce from the prototype called person. Both Bruce and person are objects. Person is a type because it has a type slot. In most other respects, person is identical to Bruce. Let's move on to behavior. And... Um, I think the last piece of IO code we're going to look at for day one is calling the proto message on both Ferrari and car from the sort of visual diagram that we looked at previously. When you call proto, it's going to tell you what the prototype of the object that you're currently looking at is. So uh, because Ferrari was cloned from car, the prototype is car. And because car was cloned from vehicle, the prototype is vehicle. And it also gives you the uh, slot information. And you can see that car has two slots, a drive slot, which is a method, and then a type slot, which is set to car. And car currently has two slots, description and type. And this is the last thing we'll cover from day one, other than the exercises, which is a summary of sort of what we know about IO at this point. Uh, the prototype programming paradigm seems clear enough. These are the basic ground rules. Everything is an object. Every interaction with an object is a message. You don't instantiate classes. You clone other objects called prototypes. Objects remember their prototypes. Objects have slots. Slots contain objects, including method objects. A message returns the value in a slot or invokes the method in a slot. If an object can't respond to a message, it sends that message to its prototype. So very similar to how inheritance works in OO languages. Uh, if it can't find... Um, a, uh, a method in sort of the drive class, it'll work its way up the superclass chain until it finds that uh, method. So moving on to the exercises for day one, and we need to speed up because this video is taking too long. Uh, there's two exercises, run an IO program from a file and execute the code in a slot given its name. So here we have uh, the solutions to this. You can see in order to run the IO file, you just go IO and then the name of the file. And then for the second problem, it says execute the code in a slot given its name. So here we're just creating an object called person uh, by cloning object. Then we're creating an object called Connor by cloning person. And then we're adding the method uh, speak. And this method is going to print BQN is my favorite language. And then when we go, uh, Connor says print line and then Connor speak, it'll print out uh, Connor says BQ is my favorite language with an exclamation mark. Moving on to day two. Uh, the only thing we're going to cover from the text, um, even though they cover a lot, is this operator table that basically comes with the IO language. And you can add your own operators, and this is sort of the precedence level. So in the repo, when you type operator table, this is what you get. And then on the right here, it'll also show you that you have basically three different types of uh, assi uh, assignments. You've got double colon equals, colon equals, and equals. So we've covered the last two, and the double colons equals is for new slot, which... I think actually is basically the same as set slot, but it also adds a couple of like get and set methods, but um, that's not covered uh, too deep, too, too deeply in this book. So moving on to the exercises from day two, we are not going to cover all of these because there's eight of them and they take quite a bit of time, but I think we're going to, we're going to cover three. We're going to cover number one, which is creating a Fibonacci. We're going to cover number three, which is summing the numbers in a matrix or a two dimensional array. And then we're going to cover the very last one, which is sort of a, a guessing game. So the first one, um, create a Fibonacci number or, or Fibonacci, uh, function. So I'm doing this on the number object, but you could have done this as sort of a free, uh, message or method in the lobby, which a couple of the people that did this, um, and you can go and take a look at those alternative solutions in the GitHub. Uh, link will be in that in the description down below as well. But you can he you can see here that what I'm doing is just a recursive solution. So you could have done this iteratively or recursively or both, but this is recursively. So uh, in the method, because we are calling this. Uh, on number, we don't actually have any arguments here. So uh, all we have to do is the implementation of this. And you can see we have an if statement, if self, uh, which is basically the number, is less than or equal to two, you return one. Otherwise, you do the recursive call, which is self minus one, 
uh, and then calling Fibonacci on that plus self minus two Fibonacci on that. And if you uh, generate the first 10 numbers, um, you can do that with uh, four I uh, from the values of one to 10 and then I fib print line. Pretty straightforward. Moving on to exercise three, write a program to add up all the numbers in a two dimensional array or uh, a matrix. And you can see here that um, you're just adding a method to your list um, called sum 2D array. And very simply, you can do this in basically just by calling flatten, which is going to flatten your 2D list or your nested list into a uh, single dimension list. And then you can just sum that up because there is a sum method on our sum 2D array. I have alternative solutions um, that actually do this uh, sort of with for loops and alternatively in a couple different ways if you want to check out the GitHub to look at those. And last but not least for day two, the guessing game. I'm not going to walk through this in detail, but it's basically what you would expect from a kind of imperative language like Python or JavaScript where we're setting a target value. Note that I'm using a fake random function that I created because, as I mentioned, we didn't have access to the random library in our 2017 version. Um, we are keeping track, track of the number of guesses, the last guess, and whether or not we have uh, found our target value. And then basically we just have a for loop, which is doing a bunch of IO input and output, um, checking to see if the guess is equal to the target value. If it's found, it prints out you found it. Otherwise, it says nope, and it lets you know based on how close you are to the number if you are uh, closer or further away by saying you're warmer or colder. So pretty straightforward. If you want, pause the video and walk through this a little bit uh, more slowly to understand it. And last but not least, that brings us to day three, which is the section that covers coroutines. And the text reads, the foundation for currency is the coroutine. A coroutine provides a way to voluntarily suspend and resume execution of a process. Think of a coroutine as a function with multiple entry and exit points. Each yield will voluntarily suspend the process and transfer to another process. You can fire a message asynchronously by using at or double at before a message. The former returns a future, more on that later, and the second returns nil and starts the message in its own thread. For example, consider the program, which we're not going to look at, but basically we're going to skip the rest of what the text says and just look at an example. So I basically tried to create a parallel sum of the uh, summation of the matrix that we looked at earlier. And I was able to make it work with the future. However, this doesn't really make sense because we're just doing something that is chunking up data. So I'm, basic I'm basically trying to sum you know, each row at a time and then sum the uh, incremental results to get the final value. But using futures for this doesn't make sense. So what I was trying to do was launch threads uh, in order to make this work. But if we change the at to a double at in order to launch threads, it's not going to work. And that's because if you uh, go back to what the text said, is that uh, the latter, the double at, uh, returns nil and starts the message in its own thread, which is a bit confusing to me because it basically sounds like the only thing you can do when launching threads with this double at symbol is side effecty stuff because you can't actually return a value uh, back to the original thread that you launched this thread from. So uh, a little bit of a sad face that I couldn't get this to work, but um, I didn't want to dive into this too deeply because I think we're already at the 20 minute mark of this video. And we're going to be covering concurrency again when we get to the Erlang chapter. So hopefully, we'll, like I said before, we're going to learn more about how to do things like that there. So that is it for this video. I know it went a bit long. Hopefully you enjoyed. Hopefully you learned something. Like I said, all of the links are going to be in the description down below if you want to check out any of the stuff that I referred to in this video. And I hope you have a great day and we'll see you in the next video.